Secret Library podcast is brought to you by our amazing Patreon supporters. You can check out the Secret Library podcast Patreon at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 108, and my guest today is Michelle Kuo, who is the author of Reading with Patrick. But before we get to that interview, we have a couple of announcements. The first of which is that the next round of the Coffee Shop Writers Group is currently open for enrollment. It will be open through June 30th at midnight Pacific time. And this time we are looking at scene and character. So you can check out all of the details and the particulars about the program, which will be starting in mid-July at carolinedonahue.com slash coffee shop. Again, that's carolinedonahue.com slash coffee shop. So I want to thank everybody as well for their really kind messages in response to last week's newsletter in which uh, we announced that my husband and I are planning to move to Berlin this fall. So that is very exciting. Yet on a daily basis, we look at each other and say, oh my God, can we really pull this off? So you will be hearing some about that in the, in the coming weeks as we figure out that little bit of adventure. And another thing that is a new development, not quite that dramatic, is that starting with last week's episode with Chibundu Onuzo and continuing this week with Michelle Kuo's episode, we have been experimenting with transcribing the episodes. So we're trying a service that transcribes the episodes and then are putting the transcriptions into the show notes posts available at secretlibrarypodcast.com rather than just the bullet points that list the topics covered in the show. And these do include timestamps. So we're wondering if that makes a difference to you all as the listeners, if it's something you enjoy, because it actually takes quite a bit of effort or it takes quite a bit of money to make the transcripts work. So we're happy to do them. I definitely see value in them in terms of people finding the show. But if it makes a difference to you, we really want to hear it because we want to make that a priority. And it's something we're thinking of making kind of part of what the Patreon can provide. So again, the Patreon address is patreon.com slash secret library, and you can let us know what you think of the transcription, if it's useful to you, by going to secretlibrarypodcast.com and leaving comments below the show notes, or if you subscribe to footnotes, which you can do either at secretlibrarypodcast.com or at carolinedonahue.com, you get put into the same newsletter list, no matter where you sign up from. Um, If you get a footnotes newsletter on Thursdays, then just hit reply and let us know if the transcript is useful to you. And if so, we will work very hard to continue doing it. Okay, so with all that news, let's get on with the show. My guest this week is Michelle Kuo. She was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan to immigrants from Taiwan. She attended public schools from kindergarten through high school, and after graduating with a degree in social studies and gender studies at Harvard College, she joined Teach for America and moved to the rural town of Helena, Arkansas, located in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. She taught English at an alternative school for kids who were expelled from other schools. Then, at Harvard Law School, Michelle worked as a student attorney on the Criminal Justice Institute, a domestic violence and family mediation clinic, and also for the Education Law Clinic Trauma Law Policy Learning Initiative. She's worked as an immigrant's rights lawyer at Centro Legal de la Raza, located in the Fruitvale District of Oakland, California. She advocated for tenants facing evictions, workers stiffed out of their wages, and families facing deportation. She's also taught courses at San Quentin through the Prison University Project, the only degree uh, that granted college degrees at a state prison in California, where she met some of the most motivated students in her life. Currently, Michelle teaches in the History, Law, and Society program at the American University of Paris on issues related to race, punishment, immigration, and the law. She won the 2016 Board of Trustees Award for Distinguished Teaching. She's married to the wonderful Albert Wu, a historian of Europe and East Asia, and Reading with Patrick is Michelle's first book. I, I can't tell you what a sort of mind-blowing conversation this was to have, because enjoying and really immersing myself in reading with Patrick was an experience all on its own, but being able to talk to Michelle about the issues surrounding the book and the issues of poverty in the American South and really how far we have to go to address that situation adequately 
was incredibly moving. And also to talk about the process of writing the book and actually getting inside of those issues and addressing things like writing about real people who you actually know, not only Patrick, but also her parents. And also looking at law and policy and writing a story over a long period of time and deciding that writing a book is really something important to you and something you need to do. So I know you're going to find this as special of an episode as I did. Michelle is so generous and open about her process, and it's just a joy to share this episode with you at last. So here we go with Michelle Quo. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Caroline. I'm totally honored. I've been um, listening to your show to get ready, and I really love your conversations. Oh, thank you so much. That's, that's amazing. I, um, well, I have to say, I then we're going to have like mutual love fest here because I could, I was like up really late the other night. I could not stop reading your book. I was like, I'm finishing it tonight. Um, and I was up, my husband's like, how late were you up last night? I was like, I could not stop reading this book. Um, that's the nicest thing you can say to a writer. Thank you. We're always worried that somebody just couldn't finish it, you know, but, or they're too polite to tell you. (laughs) Oh no, no, no. I was in it. I was in it to win it with this one. Um, So I think maybe what we could start with is that this book was not written. This is not a nonfiction book that was written in like six months. This book was clearly a chronicle of your relationship with Patrick. And did you have a sense at the beginning, because you wrote an article for the, the New York Times opinion page early on, maybe not that early on, but a good chunk of the way through Um, of your time after having taught in the Delta, and then came back to it later as a book. Like from the beginning of your teaching experience, did you imagine that you'd write a book about the process? Or were you just going because you felt called to go? Never. I never thought I would write a book about it. Not the first time I was in Arkansas when I was 22. And I'm really glad that I didn't. I think there's something about knowing that you're writing or that you're a writer that sometimes distance you, distances you from the experience because you interrupt the emotional experience with, I need to write this down or I need to remember this. Um, and I'm grateful that I just was in it. As you put it, I just felt called to be there. And it was much later when I found out that this very beloved student of mine had gotten arrested and killed somebody that I felt called to write just because I think you write when you feel confused, when you feel disordered, when you don't have a sense of why something happened. And after I wrote, I thought to myself, why was I writing about the student as if he had died, as if he doesn't exist anymore? Um, Mm -hmm. I need to be a part of his life again. And so in that sense, writing did exactly the most moral thing writing can do, which is to make you more alert and more ethical. I think ethical questions are raised later on when um, when then the person is alive and you are writing. And But, at, but in those first two moments of teaching, um, no, I, I wasn't aware that I was going to write about it. And I think, I'm, and I'm, I'm glad about, I'm glad about that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it does. It really does change things to think, you know, as I've gotten to certain points in my life where I'm like, mm, this might be a big deal. I find myself sometimes having this experience, like if you've seen the the movie Stranger Than Fiction, where Emma Thompson yeah. is narrating, I feel like it starts up, and that was the point when she knew it was all different. And I'm like, no, God, not the, not the narration voice. It's going to screw everything up. You're totally right. There's something about the narration voice that interrupts the experience that has it has this inescapable falsity yeah yeah I think I think you you want people when they go into intense experiences to not have any expectations of doing anything except being fully present in the minute you know and that's why sometimes we have to take walks without our notebooks and that's why we come up with ideas in the shower because we're, yes because we're, we're really unselfconscious we're not we're not trying and we're not grasping anything. We're just kind of relaxing into our unconscious selves. So you, I mean, you started out wanting to teach. So you went 
to the Delta to teach for Teach for America and then ended up going to law school because you wanted to work, you know, to change, help change the system. And then you're still working as a lawyer, correct? Uh, yeah, well, I'm teaching law and society classes at a college. So I'm not practicing right now, but I feel like I'm with but you're legal still in the law all the time. Yeah, yeah right. So I, I love this kind of trajectory because I think a lot of people think that the way you have to write more so in fiction than nonfiction, but is that you have to get some sort of degree in writing specifically in order to end up with a published book. And I love stories that bust that myth. And there are a disproportionate number, I think, of lawyers who end up writing books. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how that happens, because in this case, you are writing about something that's dear to you and that has informed your law career. But what do you think it is about being a lawyer and going through that kind of training that that prepares you for writing a book? That's a great question. Um, first of all, I totally agree with with what you, what you just said about how um, people do think they have to have some kind of degree in writing, and I don't. I didn't get an MFA. I have a lot of friends who did, and they had incredible experiences. But I didn't get an MFA. I didn't major in writing, creative writing, and. I didn't think of myself as a writer until I started really writing this book, which took many, many years. Legal training, I think, made me hyper aware of how important it was to have a really precise grasp of the facts. Legal writing itself, outside of it, the fact sections and opinions and outside of fact sections and legal briefs, is, 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 is painful to read usually. It's rare It's <laughs> rare that you have a legal opinion where the judge is, I think, a clear writer who intends to reach a larger audience. Sometimes you feel that lawyers and judges even revel in being difficult and technical and obscure, as if to say, my, you know, stay out of my profession unless you can, you know, pay for $100,000 and be in debt from your law school tuition. So I always tell my students that remember, remember that poor people couldn't read the decisions in Latin. Remember that it's, it's purposely written technically to keep you out. And I think maybe the desire to write about incarceration, about crime, about things related to law was a desire to make it very accessible and commonsensical and not scary for the average person who might think, oh, I can't understand any of this legal stuff unless I go to law school. So, so I guess my answer is like twofold. One is that the, I think legal stuff is really well written when they write about the facts, like what happened one day. It's, it, there's never an unsentimental word. Um, but on the other hand, when it's, when it's explaining why it came to its legal result, usually it's written in this really exclusive, difficult way that I think is meant to keep out the ordinary person. And maybe I was wanted to, to write for that ordinary person. I think also the whole story, something that you illustrated really, really beautifully was this, you know, there was this Frederick Douglass kind of narrative of people leaving the South as soon as they had the opportunity to. Um, and that you wanted to highlight the fact that there that that was in some ways a position of privilege, that anyone who had the opportunity to leave was able to do so and maybe have a different story. But there were a lot of people for whom that wasn't possible. And that what we're seeing today with people's situations is that it's sort of a generations of not having the ability to move past what happened. And that that has really impacted society. And it's not something that we can just say, oh, yeah, that was a long time ago, um, that there's still impact now. And I think that that's an important part of the narrative. I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit. Yes. I think one of the most devastating things to me about living in the rural South is how clearly there's a divide between those who can leave and those who stay behind. You see that in 2018, if um, the people who leave town leave for jobs, they go to the city, to Little Rock, Memphis, 
Dallas, Atlanta. They go to college outside of uh, these small towns of Helena, where I was. And the students who were my students were the descendants of people who couldn't leave, who didn't leave. And that's, that's really devastating to me because migration is a form of freedom to be able to leave, to search for better circumstances. That is one definition of freedom. Um, I think what a, a lot of our narratives of the South today, of the civil rights narrative primarily, is, is one of progress, where we used to have Jim Crow, but we no longer do. We used to have black and water fountains water fountains, black and white water fountains, but we no longer do. We used to have violence of white mobs against um, black people in the South, we no longer do. And I think that's the kind of narrative that I, that had drawn me to the South. And what shook me when I was there was how poisonous that narrative is, that assumption that things have gotten better, that things must get better. I think we have to have hope we have to have, believe in possibility of change, but we also have to have a very clear picture that half of African-American children um, in the Mississippi Delta are food insecure, which is a euphemism for their hungry. Um, we have to be really clear-eyed about the fact that um, the majority of kids are not reading at their school level, and yet Frederick Douglass talked about literacy as being the most clear form of, of freedom. And when we think about the rural South today, we tend not to look, not to confront squarely the limitations um, of the successes of the civil rights movement. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's really important. I think that was something that really struck me in the book is that it's, it's this sort of, I, I like how you call it a poisonous narrative that, you know, it's almost like a bedtime story that we tell ourselves, yeah. like we're in a, we're in a better situation now. Everything is so much better, but, but yet these things are happening and there's so much more to a story like Patrick's of, you know, a story of being confused, of trying to protect his sister. Like there's so much more in that story of what happened to him on a bad night, um, and I loved how you at one point fantasize about how things might have gone completely differently with a very minor shift in circumstances. And that in some ways it looks to me like a question of norms, like what people think is normal to happen. And that seeing something like where people are in such difficult circumstances and, and don't see other options, how difficult it is to even imagine your way out of that, of that kind of of that kind of situation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's how 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 to imagine yourself out. I mean, that's that's what hope is, right? To be able to imagine yourself out. So what you're really saying is that there is a norm of hopelessness. Right. A, no, a norm of not expecting to be in a different situation, to live in a city that has jobs to complete high school, complete college, to own your own business, which is what Patrick wanted. Um, and that that's, that's pretty devastating. And yes, I, I think it is about norms. I think it's about the expectation, your, the low, low expectations you have for your own success. You need to have people in your life who have made it, I think, to have that expectation. And Certainly, you know, Patrick didn't have anybody in his family who had the kind of life that he did occasionally dare to dream about, which would be to own his own mechanic business or um, to have his own house or to complete college. Um, there, you know, he didn't know one person who looked like him who had that. Right. And yet, I think the thing that is powerful about the book is the transformation that was able to happen in your relationship with him, that even over, you know, someone who was dealing with 
profound challenges in his life and in a prison was able to completely transform his relationship to reading and was memorizing poems and had completely different handwriting and all of these things just based on time that you spent with him. And I think that the the question I was left with is, how can we create systems where more people are able to spend time with people in these circumstances in such a way that those transformations can be available? Yeah, I mean, I think you just nailed it. This is what the, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what this is the heart of everything. How do we get more time between people trained to help, whether it's mental health therapists? teachers, social workers, coaches, guidance counselors, how do we get them to be spending more time with those who are most at risk, those who have experienced trauma, who are at risk of dropping out. Um, and, you know, there, there are models for change in school systems and in prisons of targeting those students, of increasing instruction, you know, small group instruction time in schools, increasing resources to get those people, the professional helpers into the classroom so that it's not one teacher helping 30 people or one program in a prison for 500 people. But all of those things are possible, but you have to have really intentional design on the part of the people in charge. And you have to have people in charge who are really listening to community members about what they need. I was just reading um, or rereading The Prize by Dale Rusikoff, which is just an amazing book. Uh, I recommend it to anybody interested in, in writing and in journalism and in education. But she was documenting the, like the failure of these higher ups to really listen to community members about programs that they needed more money for that were working, but they needed they needed more support and more integration. And it's precisely programs that you're talking about, programs that, for instance, identified children who had parents who were addicts. And these counselors were just spending time with them after school and making sure that they had somebody to talk to. And it seems so simple, it seems so small, but it means so much to those families and to those kids. That's the real tragedy to me, is that it is possible to make such a big difference with such, you know, simple assistance. And yet, in so many circumstances, the country, we, the country as a whole, have failed to provide that to so many. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's just, it's just a failure. Um, it's just unforgivable to me, uh, just how children are just screwed over from the even before they step into school because the school itself isn't equipped to help them. Yeah. I I encourage everybody to read the book because you will get a really good um, grounding in the sort of issues that we're talking about. And then I will provide links to the prize in the show notes. But I wanna I wanna ask another question from another angle about the process of creating the book, which is that you, this is something I hear from writers all the time, is a big fear of theirs, is writing about the people in their lives. And you write about friendships you have, but in particular, you write about your relationship with your parents and also your relationship with Patrick, both of which are very charged and meaningful relationships uh, in your life. And so I wondered how you handled the process. You talk a little bit about how Patrick gave permission for you to write about it and how important it was for you to show him the article in the New York Times even before you began the book. But I'm wondering also how it impacted your relationship with your parents to write about that relationship in the book. Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, my God. I would wake up in a panic every morning because I was writing about real people. So I sympathize with anybody who is just torn about the question, should I write this? Should I write about real people? Should I expose them? And I have no words of comfort. You know, I think the moment we, (laughs) (laughs) I think the moment you try to rationalize it, you try to defend yourself, that just, just stop. Just accept that there is going to be something problematic and morally compromised about it. And I think once you embrace that, 
you embrace that complexity. You don't try to forgive yourself or exculpate yourself. You can actually relax. It's really contradictory, right? Because um, we're always seeking to forgive ourselves. And this is a case where I think there is just something something wrong. There's something wrong about exposing somebody else to the page, even if legally they give consent, even if personally you're portraying them as warmly as possible, even if, in fact, as I did do, I protected some of their secrets, you know, the, some of, some stuff that I knew they wouldn't want, truly wouldn't want out, out there. And I think also the key is to write as if nobody will see it, as if it will never be published, and then to revise and cut later on. Because you still, it is still a journey to see what you will say, to honestly confront yourself through others. And there's no question that, as I wrote about my parents, over seven years, I became more forgiving and less hardened towards them, more understanding, more curious of their past, more alert to them, more alert to my own um, selfishness with them. You know, when you write a scene where you're narrating the fight and you're like, well, they're obviously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> after, after the end of the three hours of writing, you're like, oh, OK, uh, maybe I was wrong <laughs> or maybe I was hard or maybe I was actually the arrogant one. So it is no, it is. It is this is this contradictory thing where you're guilty for exposing them, but if you're doing it right, if you're truly facing yourself on the page, they will come out of it looking better than you, <laughs> right? And I and I think I think that's that's the hope that's the hope behind writing. Um, and even as I look at older drafts of mine from five years ago that I ditched. I ditched them because the narrator was whiny and self-absorbed and thought that her parents had wronged her, you know? And and it's not how I justify writing about them, but it's how I understand their writing process, that it is this perpetual kind of cleansing of one's flaws or through through exposure of them, through being vulnerable to the idea that you are flawed as a person, you know? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because writing about personal experience, it, it's hard to say which came first. You know, did the relationship change because you got older or did the relationship change because you were writing about it and then had different insight about it and therefore were able to participate in it in a different way and then write about it some more in a different way? I totally relate. Yes. I couldn't have said that better. And I don't know. I don't know. Which one I don't is think it? there's any way to know. It's probably both at <laughs> the same time. Because there's no way to do it over without writing about it and see how it was different. <laughs> We don't have like the Hermione time turner from Harry Potter to like do things in parallel and see how they play out differently. Oh, Hermione. I know. I love her. I love her. She's too. the best. She's my favorite. Yeah, she's my spirit animal. She um, and Neville. Oh, yes, Neville. Hard not to love Neville. Exactly. The 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 thoughtful nerdy ones are always the best. Um yeah, I think that's something that's that that fascinates me because I think that most people think about, oh, if I write about these people, it's going to hurt them. Like if I write about the people in my life, they're going to be exposed and feel vulnerable. And I think that's what we all worry about, like almost like writing is a weapon. Whereas I love the way you've just described it, which is that in many ways, it may have made your relationship with your parents stronger. And it may have given perspective that wouldn't have been available had you not written about them. Yeah, I, I definitely think it gave me perspective on them because I realized as I was running how little I knew about Taiwan, which is where they're from, how little I knew about their motives for wanting me to get out of Arkansas. I, I had a, I just, I had to find out in order to write it. Um, in terms of like how they actually reacted to the book, you know, my dad read the book. He liked it. His English is pretty good so we could read it. And my mother couldn't finish it because she was really sensitive about like what I said about her. Mm. And so it's funny. 
it's it's funny i'm just thinking about it while i'm talking to you yeah my dad was is a less vulnerable person and then he finished it my mother has always been a vulnerable person she couldn't finish it it's like the book didn't change <laughs> you know what i mean it's, i don't know i don't know what i'm trying to say i'm just it's just uh, there's something about how the book reflected their reading practices reflected back who they were, but I don't think it changed the relationship as much as I feared that it, it, it would, you know? I mean, it, 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 what really happened was that it changed my idea of them through my, my writing of them. I think that's comforting too for anyone thinking about writing about people, that the most profound change happened within yourself and that it ultimately didn't, I mean, you have to do this with integrity. You can't just smear somebody in a book and then be like, everything's going to be the same. Um, but I think if you, like you said, if you do this the right way, you're going to take more of the brunts yourself as the writer if it's a if it's a charged relationship. And that that may transform your relationship to it in the process of writing more so than it changes anything about about them. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's definitely true with my parents. I will say that with Patrick, it's a little more, it's, 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 it's more, um, loaded Mm. because there is a history of just like a teacher savior narrative and their teacher of the outsider writing about African American community. So I, I was super conscious and I'm still anxious about it. And so I try to resolve this in, in several ways. Like I, for the advance for the book, I, I've sh- donated it to charity and shared it with his family. I've, you know, talked to him about the book. There is, I do, I do think that there, there is the question of protecting him. Like I didn't use his last name; I used mm-hmm. a different last name. But like I said before, I, I think there is some level of, there is some uncomfortable inescapably uncomfortable aspect of a writer writing about a subject who is more poor and has fewer resources and I I just I don't have a I don't have a resolution or defense to that you know I think we have to look in the mirror at the end of the day and and that's it that's it and I think a person knows if they've done it with financial and moral integrity in terms of how they share the advance and in terms of how they write about the person but there are no there are no rules and there's yeah there are no rules I don't know if that makes sense I think I mean that's both the blessing and the curse of it too is that there isn't any sort of rule book to follow except your best intentions I think (laughs) I mean, that's another thing, too, is is that in some ways, I think that you're somewhat protected from the beginning in terms of writing a book, because it's not like making a film where the, the potential for income is much higher. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I don't know anybody who's gotten like a $10 million book advance and then has to worry about the, the ramifications of that. But it's true. it is money and you are rewarded for it in, in other ways and what that means. So I think that's an that's a tricky thing to wrestle with. Yeah, absolutely. Did Patrick, has Patrick read the book? He has read parts of the book about his mom. Like I read a lot of those parts to him. Um, he was really moved by those because he didn't know that his mother had said things about him. Like, I hope he just comes home. I think he was mm. just protecting his sister. I think he was trying to impress his dad. I think he didn't know his mother had said all that stuff. And he also didn't, he just wanted to hear her voice, which I hope I captured a little bit. Um, so that, that for me was a little, that was a relief to me that he liked those parts. He didn't read parts or want to read parts about being in jail too much, I think. I think that he found that a little traumatic. So I didn't force that on him. Well, fair, yeah, you yeah. probably don't want to relive that. Yeah, exactly. What is... Um, what is his relationship to the book now? Like, is he, is, are you staying in contact with him about it? Is, is there any, anything you're working on together or what is he doing now? 
Right now, he just moved to Little Rock and he's been trying to find work. Uh, he joined this formerly incarcerated church group, I think, which has been a source of, um, source of happiness for him. But I think, and I think he sees his daughter regularly, who's still in Helena, and she's doing really well at the charter school. Great. So there's some hope and there's still some instability. I try not to get, I try to moderate my own emotions, not to get too excited or too despairing because I went through that roller coaster and it's not healthy. I try to just go with wherever he is, but he's still, he's still searching, I think, for his place in the world. And that's, 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 that's it. That's all. Yeah. I, I think that was really well conveyed that it isn't sort of an easy solution. It's not like, you know, it isn't like one of these movies where, you know, the tough, smart spoken teacher comes into the difficult school situation and <sighs> makes some moving speeches and jumps up on the desk. And, <laughs> and then everybody is suddenly like running their own multi million dollar businesses coming out of that school. But as much as we want it to work that way, we don't get that kind of easy solution to generations of of sort of destabilization in a community. I know I wanted to write the ending, but that's not the ending. The ending is not finished. It's And it's a story also about how brutal we are to people who come out of prison. We don't have a plan for them. We don't welcome them in. It's a story also about the lack of social services and state services um he has debt from health care because he doesn't have health care and debt from child support in jail which just piles up pointlessly and so he can't open a bank account i mean it's a story about the failure of society in so many ways and then it's also a story about a person who's still dealing with his past and is alone and dealing with it you know if if you as a lawyer who have access to sort of thinking about the system could rewrite any portion of, of the way our social structure works, like what do you think would make the biggest difference if we could change, I don't know, one thing? Wow. Well. I know just one is tough. Just one is really tough. But since I'm really passionate about how to reintegrate prisoners back into society and truly give them as the chance that they deserve they've served their time i would require all prisons to have education programs and direct connections to employers a year before they're let out mm. and i would condition the pay of wardens on on the recidivism rates of the prisoners so that wardens knew their job was to create prisoners who wouldn't come back, who had a stable life outside. And it would be on them to connect employers to prisoners long before the prisoners are even going to come out. That's but amazing. I, yeah, I would do that. I guess that puts a lot of pressure on the prison system and less pressure on the employers. So I, I guess you would additionally have to incentivize employers to be good citizens. Um, but I think just shifting, shifting the burden to the actual systems that are, su are supposed to rehabilitate, that are supposed to teach, that are supposed to offer some kind of change would be a huge shift in how we think about how, how we think about um, crime. Exactly. Yeah, you also talk in the book about things that are the sort of disproportionate sentencing given because of the desire to have a source of labor, which I think is something that people may be shocked by in reading about, but is an important thing for people to know has happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's one of those where you look at a system that has so many issues with it and then that you know it took us a really long time to get into this mess it's unfortunate that we can't just leap right out of it really quickly that it takes longer 
And that's, I think, the real tragedy is you see people whose lives are at stake, you know, as we figure this out. Mm-hmm. And, you, and there's there's no intentional design on the part of anybody, right? This, the public school that Patrick went to, the prison, the, the prisons, he county jails that he um, was a part of just people people don't have a, a plan to help him and support him right and he's not he's not alone now so you've just released this book so I always ask people this question and I always think that they might like throw up in their mouth a little bit but, um, <laughs> <laughs> is, are do you have plans to write more books or is this sort of your book given that you know it doesn't sound like you woke up at the age of five and were like, one day I will write books. That is my dream. <laughs> but having written one and written one really beautifully, I have to say, um, was this something that you felt like, okay, I got, I got it out of my system or are you, are other ideas creeping into your mind as well? Okay. Well, <laughs> I do want to throw up in my, my mouth. I um, know. No, I know. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's a, it's a good question. You know, I always loved reading. I always liked to write, but I always thought of myself as a quote unquote useful person. I was an activist, I was a social worker, I worked at a homeless shelter, I was a legal aid lawyer for tenants and workers. I mean, I really, this sounds really morally stupid but I really just I I aspired to be a saint you know like Dorothy Day or Mother Teresa and it's only recently as I've had to speak in public and be a writer with a capital W that I understood how like how gendered all of that was in the past 10 years just like I wanted to be a really good woman Mm. um to be a writer was to be selfish or to be spending time with your door closed on your own work. That's what, that, that's what I, I viewed that as like a luxury. I didn't give myself permission to do that. And it has been amazing in the past three years as I finally forced myself to finish the book, to close my door, to turn in the draft, to accept that it was done, to be proud of certain sentences that I understood that I like hadn't been giving myself permission to write, you know, I wanted to be good, not, mm. not to write. And it's a stupid binary, binary, we, we can be good and write. But it, it, it is true that I think it is harder for women to close the door. It's harder for us to not say yes to showing up during an emergency for a friend or at a homeless shelter or you know, or just to feel permission to be selfish. And I think you do have to, to write, you do have to be a little selfish. You do have to decide that three hours spent on writing one sentence was three hours well spent. Um, And it is true that men historically have had permission to do that. or they haven't so that, felt guilty about it. Yeah, they haven't felt guilty. Yeah, feeling guilty is the, the key thing here. Thanks. So that's a long wooden way to say I do want to write more. Um, the, the well is dry. Like the story came totally f- because I had to write it because I would have gone crazy if I didn't write it down. I had to record the extraordinary change that Patrick had made in jail. I had to write about literacy and how it changes your experience of incarceration. It makes you more human i had to write about my own sense of moral failure and but also what it means to try to create relationships across class and race that this is something we must do um but now that that story is written i want to write more but i don't want to write if i don't have anything to say so yes i do want to write but I'll wait to see <laughs> what it's about. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's true. Like when you've spent as many years, you know, in the relationship and writing about the relationship as you have with Patrick, I can imagine where you're like, I don't even know where to begin because <laughs> do I have to sort of go through a similarly intense experience to justify a book? Exactly. And what 
but that I guess that's the question is what you know what justifies a book for anybody true <laughs> maybe we just have to sit down and show up every day and we have th- we always have things to say I mean that's the other thing especially for the listeners out there who want to write are afraid to write maybe haven't had a degree in writing you know there's no wrong way to do that. I was just listening to Marilyn Hacker speak about this. She was telling students, the poet Marilyn Hacker, there is no wrong way to do it. You, you just start with a page and you have a conversation with yourself and you go from there and you try to do that every day and try to read every day. And that's it. That's, that's the formula. If there's any formula at all. I love that. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so, so much for for taking time from your very busy schedule to talk about reading with Patrick and about your process of writing it. It's been really wonderful talking to you, Michelle. Thank you so much. You've asked, you, you're, you've asked such insightful questions. It's such a, such a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.